good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this class. I am happy to see that we have men here because some people asked me, is this only for women? And I was like, no way is this only for women. This is for all of us. And so thank you for being here. Um, my name is Sarah Barton. I'm the university chaplain here at Pepperdine. And so we love having all of you here on campus this week and filling the spaces that are normally filled by our students. So thank you for being here. I, will, I would like to say my husband is here today since this is really going to reflect somewhat on him at times. And so <laughs> my husband is here sitting in the middle. This is John and uh, um, a wonderful, wonderful partner. Okay, so I'm going to start, I think appropriately, I wanna start just reading a little poetry. We're gonna read a Wendell Berry poem. If you don't read Wendell Berry, then I really suggest this book. Uh, the title is This Day Collected in New Sabbath Poems. Even if you don't like poetry or think you don't like poetry, I think you could take a look at it. Um, and so I'm not really gonna introduce Wendell Berry that much. If you know and love him, that's great, but if you don't, uh, things will work out fine. But I'm, I, I'm actually going to ask you, if you're not sitting right by someone, I am going to ask you to have a couple of short conversations. I promise not to embarrass you too much. Um, I know the topic might make you think that, but I promise the things we talk about, you can trust me. But I am going to ask you, after hearing this poem, uh, I want you just to kind of talk to someone else beside you about uh, what can you say about the person who wrote this poem, and what can you say about um, his experience of God? Just from hearing this poem. Okay, so this is a, a poem Wendell Berry wrote in 2002. The cherries turn ripe, ripe, and the birds come. Red-headed and red-bellied woodpeckers, blue jays, cedar wax wings, robins, beautiful, hungry, wild in our domestic tree. I pick with the birds, gathering the red cherries, alight among the dark leaves, my hands so sticky with juice, the fruit will hardly drop from them into the pail. The birds pick as I pick, all of us delighted in the weighty heights, the fruit red ripe, the green leaves, the blue sky and the white clouds, all tending to flight, making the most of this sweetness against the time when there will be none. And you are to me, my love, as a tree of ripe cherries, and I am a wild bird, high in your branches, hungry, ready to fly. Okay, so what can you say about this person who wrote this poem? What is he like? What can you say about the one he loves? And what can you say about God? So just have a little short conversation with someone near you. Okay, I'm going to call you back quickly. I know I just got conversation started, but just call out a couple of words. What can we say about this poet? What is he like? He's in nature. He's creative. Appreciation for beauty, observant. He's using all of his senses. Good. Hungry, the guy is like, he shows us hungry. He what? Horny. Horny. <laughs> so, I knew this is where this would go. Okay, so then you see him. He's picking cherries, and suddenly he's talking about his wife. By the way, in 2002, let's see, Wendell Berry must have been about 60, if we could figure that out. So uh, maybe not quite, quite there yet. But anyway, that kind of also adds a little bit to the poem, I think, to consider um, to consider his age when he wrote this. If you don't read Wendell Berry, please uh, read Wendell Berry. I love him. Uh, now I'm going to share, we're going to kind of do this, do a little poetry here to get us going in the right directions for the Song of Songs. Now, even though this makes me kind of nervous, I'm going to read because I don't get really nervous speaking, but sharing like the inside of me is what it's like when I sh share a poem that I wrote. 
Um, I just started writing poetry a couple years ago since I moved here to, um, to Malibu. And so I wrote a poem for my husband on his 50th birthday, and I'm going to share that with you now. So I didn't write it on my paper, so I'll read it from here. So again, what can you say a little bit about our relationship? So this is my poem to John. Dear John, this is not your normal Dear John letter. <laughs> Dear John, as of this, your 50th year, over half of your years have been mine too, ours. As a young man, passionate for thought and life and God, you returned my gaze and desire, and your desires plus mine became ours. In a life where vocations have been so intertwined that sometimes we are uncertain if an idea is mine or yours, for it is ours. At 50, there is no denying that we are no longer young, for our young are grown and gone. For years, we were occupied with making two more, our boy, our girl. But now it's just us again, back to the math where we began, two making one in our home. And so I celebrate 50-year you, thankful that it's you plus me, counting our years, counting our birthdays, counting our hours. So this is my love poem. Not quite as... Um, as specific as Wendell Berry gets, or as, like, this is risque for me. Uh, whenever I talk about two becoming one, we all know what that kind of really is about, so. Um, anyway. That should get us, we'll get back to poetry in a few minutes. I was recently told about a campus ministry at a secular university where they set up a large marker board in the middle of a busy campus and invited all passing college students to write down their questions for God. What are your questions for God? And one of the questions written in bold and then circled again and again that sort of drew the attention of everyone who was a part of this project was, why do Christians hate sex? Unfortunately, Christians do have a ne negative reputation when it comes to views about sex. And so one of the campus ministers was on a panel after uh, where they, they addressed these questions that students have for God. And one of the campus ministers, a woman, uh, was really quick in her answer because they, when they asked this question to the panelists that the students had come up with, they asked these questions. She said, why do Christians hate sex? Maybe it's because they're doing it wrong. And so she kind of flipped that a little bit for the students. Um, unfortunately, we do have a negative reputation when it comes to views about sex. I was thinking about it because um, I would guess this is true. We are probably more comfortable like seeing one of those erectile dysfunction commercials that run across TV. We've all had to kind of get used to those commercials. I remember when they first started and thought, surely those will never last, but that was many years ago. And now we're still watching these commercials come in to our homes and into our lives, and we've sort of gotten used to that. And yet we're not used to hearing Christian people talk about sex in religious settings like this. And so it was one of the reasons I really wanted to speak about it today. It's one of the reasons that I wanted to kind of talk about it because I think, especially working with college students, this story uh, really uh, convicted me that we need to talk about things more openly. Uh, two things I don't have time to talk about in relation to these students' questions, but I'm going to say them very quickly and then get on to the main point. First, I want to say that there are serious dangers associated with purity culture. If you aren't sure what purity culture is, write it down, maybe look it up later. A popular Christian blogger whose name also happens to be Sarah, Sarah Bessie, told this story. Sarah was 19 years old and she says that she had just become crazy in love with Jesus when a preacher spoke about the importance of staying pure for marriage. As an illustration, he passed around a cup of water and asked everyone to spit in it as it went around. Some of the boys hawked their worst into that cup, 
while everyone laughed. And then the preacher held up that cloudy cup of water and, and spit and asked, who wants to drink this? And everybody in the crowd made barfing noises and said, no way, gross. And he said, this is what you are like if you have sex before marriage. You are asking your future husband to drink this cup. Notice he didn't say husband or wife to drink this cup. Sadly, Sarah reports that she was not a virgin at that time, and she shares how it took her years to overcome the shame of that well-intentioned, perhaps, talk. She asks whether we need to rethink the way that we talk about sex in the church. Like I said, I don't have time to go into the dangers of purity culture, but it's, it is a related topic to what we're talking about today, and I encourage you to read Richard Beck's book, Unclean, as well as check out his blog, Experimental Theology. He has, a, he has some really good blog posts where he talks about purity culture. In my ministry with college students, I've made it a point that while I will bear witness to God's guidance for us about sex, like I bear witness to God's guidance for us about a lot of things, they will not hear shame-based and condemning messages from me. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any other power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the message I want them to hear. Okay, so that's one of the things I wish I had a whole lecture to talk about, but I don't. The other point I wish I could talk about more is the idol the church has made of marriage. We sometimes act as if the church exists for married people with children. We talk about biblical marriage and biblical families as if that's all we are about in the church. People who are not married often feel that they don't have a valid position or a purpose in the church. Now, there was a time in Christian history where Christians idealized the celibate life, as if celibate people were more spiritual or closer to God than married people. But it appears to me that we may have taken ourselves in a completely different direction. And so as I talk about sexuality today and about marriage, I do not want to contribute to any kind of Christian caste system. There is no Christian caste system. Some Christian people marry and some Christian people don't. They are all Christian people and should be valued equally for their spiritual gifts and empowered to use them among us. For if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, just as God chose. So, so those are two things I wish I could talk about more, but I at least had to give a little caveat. I don't have time to talk about those Today I will talk about the celebration of sexuality in the Song of Songs and explore specifically the pastoral imagination that led it to be assigned to a place of prominence at Passover. A few years ago, I made a Facebook mistake that brought out some of the humor of the Song of Songs. I had a big vegetable garden when we lived in Michigan. We've since, I have a picture of it here, I think, yeah. This was its best day ever. It was decorated and everything. <laughs> I had this garden, and it was my garden. I loved that garden. Uh, John did almost zero work in it, <laughs> somewhat because he's not interested in gardening, and mostly because I do not trust him to know a weed from an asparagus plant that I've been cultivating for five years. But each spring, I got out this old tiller, I would bought it at a yard sale. It really was not a great tiller. And John would till the garden for me. So as I sat in the kitchen one day watching him till the garden, I felt great appreciation and love. <laughs> so I posted on Facebook, John is speaking my love language. He's tilling my garden. <laughs> and then one friend wrote, I hope the kids aren't home. <laughs> And one of our students wrote, I will call him Dr. Solomon from now on. <laughs> and the minister at our church wrote, I thought Facebook was rated PG. <laughs> and it digressed from there. And I had that difficult, do I erase it? Do I delete it? 
Oh my goodness, everybody talked about it for quite a while. Actually, John is not on Facebook, and I didn't tell him what I had done. And local, uh, luckily, no one else told him what I had done until Mark Love, who's here, told him at a religion department meeting. I guess this is what they talk about at religion department meetings. But anyway, that's how I was eventually found out for my... Uh, I really didn't mean it like that. Um, but uh, with that story in mind, let's dig into the Song of Songs. Some, uh, just review a few basic things. Some of these were mentioned uh, already in other lectures that we've heard. Some people do call it the Song of Solomon. It does have some connections to Solomon. The timing and direct connection is disputed. Um, there, it's, there are just all kinds of theories out there about exactly how uh, connected to Solomon it is. I actually prefer Song of Songs because I think that just says this is the, the best of songs. It was probably written around the 4th century before Christ. It does not mention the name of God. All the content is in the mouths of speakers. So we have the maiden, we have the shepherd lover, we have the daughters of Jerusalem. It's, it does include sexual language and metaphors so much that it often makes us squirm. It's poetic, it's dramatic. Most agree it's just something simple. It's a collection of love poems. And like poetry, it has literal, literal and it has allegorical meanings. Historically, it has been read at the Passover, uh, as in a concluding reading of the Passover meal. Now, I want to explore a little bit about Song of Songs that is not as well known. I don't know if you're aware of this, but most lines are given to the woman who is speaking. More lines are given to the woman who is speaking than to the man. We should note that this is out of the ordinary, even unprecedented in the Bible. Um, I'm kind of curious, how many of you have ever heard a woman teach from Song of Songs in mixed company before today? One, my husband. <laughs> One other time I, I did this. Yeah, he was there. Um, I think that's just a little bit tragic. Um, almost two-thirds of the verses, 62% are quotations of the Shulamite woman or the daughters of Jerusalem, while about one-third of the quotations are from the male perspective. So she has more to say in this song than the man does. And yet, how many of you have heard a man talk about the Song of Songs before in mixed company. Okay, so quite a few. Some of you have never heard anyone talk about the Song of Songs. The female voice dominates this book of the Bible to a greater extent than any book or text in the Bible. Nowhere else in Scripture are the thoughts and the imaginations and the yearnings and the words of a, of a woman, an ancient woman, so available to us. Now, one school of thought among scholars suggests that a woman actually wrote the Song of Songs. That would be monumental in the canon. Brenner, for example, makes the point that some passages are so essentially feminine that a male could hardly imitate their tone and texture successfully. So a woman was at least part of writing some of it. Uh, others argue for female uh, authorship, simply noting that the song is part of an extensive tradition of women who sang in Scripture. We have the song of Miriam, and Hannah, and Deborah, and Mary, and Elizabeth, for example. And it's acceptable for women to sing in Scripture, even about sex. There are plenty of people who reject this idea of female authorship. For example, one of them, D. Kleins, holds the opinion that the woman of the song is the perfect woman from a male perspective, and that a man wrote the Song of Songs, highlighting the ideal dream of most men's. She's a man's fantasy, he says. Women aren't really like that. We can only hope that they would be like that. All in all, we cannot prove who wrote the Song of Songs and whether that person was a man or a woman, but I think all of these, uh, these theories about it are very interesting. But since she is highlighted so prominently, I want to listen to the Shulamite woman. What is she like? 
So we are actually going to discuss it a little bit after you hear a couple of lines of poetry. I'm going to go through some of the poetry from the woman and then from the man. And then I'm going to ask you to kind of think about the same things we did with Wendell Berry. What is this person? What are these people like? Okay, so from I'm using um, Robert Alter's um, uh, commentary and version of this as I read. So this, it may sound a little bit different than from what you've heard uh, before. Um, from her first lines, it is obvious that this woman is not shy. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. And I want to note here that um, uh, she sort of doesn't exactly take the action herself, like, hey, man, I'm coming, I'm going to kiss you right now. But she does take initiative here and throughout the book. Uh, she doesn't say, I will kiss him. She just says, I'm very available. Let him <laughs> kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And then she talks about his love being better than wine. I could, it's like she's saying, I could have wine on my lips and in my mouth, but I prefer his kiss. So from the very first lines of this poem, we start to squirm a little, and we start to realize, wow, this is going to get kind of hot and heavy. Okay, so then we'll skip over to chapter 5. This is a, a, probably a fairly well-known passage. I'll read through it and comment on it a little bit. So it's like the daughters of Jerusalem ask her, How is your lover more than another, O fairest among women? And they're asking her, you, they've just seen her sort of swooning over this man. She, she's just, uh, she, she actually puts herself in danger for him. She, she's just fainting in response to him, and they say, hey, what's the big deal? How's he, how's he so much better than others? And so then she answers their question. My lover is shining white and ruddy, standing out among 10,000. So it's like she's saying, he's one in a million. His head is pure as gold. His locks are curls black as raven. His eyes are like doves by streams of water. She has been looking deeply into his eyes where the pupils become like uh, they're set in pools of water. Bathing in, his eyes are like doves by streams of water, bathing in milk, dwelling by a pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, sprouting aromatic scents. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are coils of gold inset with ruby. His loins are fine wrought ivory with sapphire inlaid. She's using language of perfect things to describe him. His thighs are ivory pillars set on pedestals of gold. He's so perfect, he is like a statue. Like Lebanon, his look is. He is choice as the cedars. He's, she's saying he's tall, he's lofty. He's, his stature is like a mountain. There's grandeur when I look at this man. His mouth is sweetest drink. So she goes back to that idea of of, um, his, of kissing him being like something so sweet. His mouth is sweet as drink. So let me just summarize, ladies, she says. All of him is delight. So you notice in this poem, she goes from, uh, from head to toe, and then she goes back up there and ends with his, with his mouth again. Okay, now I will skip the part where he compliments her for having a full set of teeth in chapter 6. And I'm going to go on over to chapter 7, even though I love that part about the teeth. Okay, so here's how he describes her. Um, he starts with the feet and then goes up from there. Some of the uh, scholars I read said she gets his attention when she's dancing and he sees her feet while she's dancing and then he describes her from there. So we all knew dancing and what it leads to. And so that's kind of what happens here. He says... How fair your feet in sandals, O daughter of a nobleman, the curves of your thighs like wrought rings, the handiwork of a master. Your navel, a crescent bowl, let mixed wine never lack. Your belly, a mound of wheat hedged about with lilies. 
I always picture that like in the, in the storybooks of, of when I was little, like when the, they would take the wheat and they would gather it together and put something around the middle, so like the hay, the hay or the wheat and tie something around it. I mean, what he's saying is you have an hourglass figure. That's exactly what that mound of wheat hedged with lilies is. Your two breasts like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes like pools in Heshbon by the gate of the town of Grandees. Your nose like the Tower of Lebanon looking down <laughs> upon Damascus. Not exactly what I want to hear, but <laughs> your head upon you like Mount Carmel and the locks of your head are purple. It's, it's like he's saying it, it, uh, it's so black it's got blue highlights. <laughs> a king is caught in the tangle. And so you picture her um, hair flowing in front of her eyes, and he's sort of seeing her eyes there, and they're flirting. A king is caught in the tangle. How fair you are, how sweet, a love among delights. Your st- <laughs> this one's just funny. Your stature was like a palm tree, and your breasts were like the clusters. I thought, I will climb the palm. <laughs> I will grasp its stalks and let your breasts be like grape clusters. Come, my lover, let us go out. Whew, okay. (laughs) What can we say about the people who wrote these poems? What can we say about their understanding of intimacy? Talk to each other. Okay, I know that's not long. We, we have to go fast, but I just want to hear a few words again. Just shout out some words. What did you hear? Louder. They're sexual. <laughs> they're passionate. I think they're both rich. Do you think that they, they both describe things that make you wonder? Yeah, they, they describe these, these rich things. There's some really interesting commentary on that. Yeah. This true understanding of each other, this seeing of one another. Maybe, maybe love is blind. Yeah, kind of like love is blind. Do they really look that good? <laughs> Do they really? Does anybody really look? Were they just like the most beautiful people? Or were they really just looking with these eyes of love so that that's how they looked to one another? I think we can say they are comfortable talking about sex. They're comfortable talking about bodies. They're descriptive. My poem seems so bland in, in contrast to this. They talk about in intimacy. In the whole of the song, we can note that the Shulamite woman is a sensual and a passionate woman. She takes initiative. She seeks the shepherd. She is responsive to him. She wants intimacy, and she is intimate. She is self-aware. She is wise. She is aware of the mighty flame of sexuality. She makes it clear to her quite often that for her, love is more important than wealth and things. A big question of the Song of Songs is, what do we do with this in a religious context? Now, while it's true that interpretations of every passage of the Bible have varied throughout Christian history, I think the Song of Songs is just rivals all of them in hilarity. It's so funny to read. Uh, to look back across Christian history and see a bunch of celibate men squirm as they interpret this love poem, (laughs) largely about a woman's view of intimacy and sexuality. I don't have time to go into all of the Jewish interpretations of the poem, but I will say that they're similarly varied to the Christian interpretations. And so we'll start with Origen, an early church leader who was committed to a spirituality disconnected from the flesh. We would call that a disembodied spirituality. So his spirituality, he wanted it to have nothing to do with the flesh. So, by undergoing castration, it appears that he did to his own body what he did to the Song of Songs. He desexed it. He taught that it's an allegory of the marriage of the word of God, the bridegroom, with the soul of a Christian, the bride. And so then for generations and generations, we see the gymnastics of interpretations that followed his leadership. For example, Hippolytus understands the two breasts of the woman in chapter 4 to to refer to the Old and the New Testaments. (laughs) 
Gregory of Nyssa said, you know the part about the teeth being like a flock of sheep? That part I didn't read. Um, he says that we should use our full set of spiritual teeth to break the divine mystery into small morsels to make God's mystery understandable. That's what that's about. I like what Ambrose did with the image of the belly button being like a goblet full of wine. He said that the soul of the human is connected to Christ like an umbilical cord, and through the navel we receive nourishment like a baby from the mother. Okay, I don't have time to go into all of these, but that's what a lot of early interpretation looks like. During the Middle Ages, between the 4th and the 11th centuries, there are at least 32 Christian commentaries on the Song of Songs, while by, by comparison there are only six in, on Galatians and only nine on Romans. It was very popular. Influential theologian and biblical interpreter Jerome, who lived in the fourth century, is an interesting character, who renounced the desires of the flesh to fan the fires of the soul. It is said that he would purposefully throw himself into thorn bushes when he felt the onset of sexual arousal. He wrote to a young disciple named Paula, Learn from the Psalms and the Proverbs. Learn from the patience and virtue of Job. Drink in with a willing heart the acts of the apostles and the epistles. Never lay aside the gospels. After enriching your mind with all these scriptures, commit to memory the prophets, the books of Kings and Chronicles, the roles of Ezra and Esther. When you have done all these, you may then safely read the Song of Songs, but not before. For were you to read it at the beginning, you would fail. In the 1100s, St. Bernard spent 18 years and wrote 86 sermons about how the Song of Song is an allegory about what happens in contemplation. He wrote that Jesus lifts the sinner to his lips for a kiss. It sounds strange in our world, but that represents how powerful the contemplative life was for him. Luther taught that the song was about the relationship between God and Solomon, and he read it almost like a political allegory, which... With our politics, I think, why not give it a try? Maybe we, need, maybe we can use the Song of Songs to help figure things out. Uh, John Wesley viewed it as an allegory about Christ and the church and, that, and wrote that if the Song of Songs were sexual, it would be absurd and monstrous. I find all of this history fascinating. Um, considering all the historical brouhaha uh, in interpretation, I think we may never really know exactly how to interpret these poems. But if you think about it, that's actually true of all poetry. We don't, don't you ever read a poem and wonder what was in that poet's mind? Poetry is mysterious. You can't exactly pin down meanings. It is meant to create these multiple interpretations. That's what poem, poetry is like in its very essence. So I think we're supposed to grapple with what the Song of Songs means for us in our contemporary culture. So we can set aside some of these, we can learn from these interpretations, and then we can try to think, what could this possibly be, be saying to us now? And none of us can deny that we hear a lot of public language about sex. This last campaign year, we all heard more than we wanted to hear. In rushed conversations before going to print, journalists had to make decisions about what words would be appropriate for the front page of the newspapers and around dinner tables. Parents had to explain such things as the P word to their children, hoping and praying that their explanations would be developmentally appropriate. During the election and too often in our society, we all hear expressions of disbelief, outrage, even lament at the state of sexual activity and language in our culture. We hear about sexual assault and sexual misbehavior almost every time we turn on the TV. We should be upset. I especially worry how all these stories are re-traumatizing men and women who have been sexually assaulted. But in addition to outrage and lament, faithful people must also turn inward and examine ourselves for where we have been complicit where our language and actions about sex have contributed positively or negatively to the culture of sex in our communities. Salt, light, yeast. These are images Christ Jesus gave Christian communities regarding our role in our wider community, and I think it's a good time to ask what kind of witness we are when it comes to human sexuality. We're actually quite practiced 
when it comes to outrage, condemnation, and drawing lines in the sand concerning sex. Tragically, our communities are crystal clear regarding what Christians are against when it comes to sex. Same, sex, sex. In recent years, we have so reduced conversations about sexuality to homosexuality that there's been little time or effort given to what Christians are for when it comes to sex, or if we are for anything. No wonder college kids ask, why do Christians hate sex? Whether we like it or not, that is the cultural perception of Christians, of Christians when it comes to uh, sexuality. We desperately need public communal language about sex. And even though we have this often overlooked resource in the Bible, as Rick said in his lecture on Tuesday, we are obviously more comfortable with the broken state of relationships in Genesis 3 than we are with Genesis 2 and what we were created for. We're simply more comfortable talking about what Donald Trump said on that bus or what Bill O'Reilly said at his place of work than we are talking about sex, healthy sex, in the church when we're together. In light of what we've heard lately, it seems like a good time to let a wise woman speak about sexual activity that's right and good. The way many women are feeling in our society, it seems healthy to listen to the Shulamite woman sing about intimate, sensual, erotic passion. In all her talk about kissing, touching, tasting, and smelling, she does not offend with crass or vulgar language. She exemplifies how it's possible to speak about sex and intimacy appropriately. We might do well to let her teach us a thing or two. I'm challenging all the men, and they are almost exclusively men in our movement, to let this woman speak through you. You could empower other women to do that, just a suggestion, but I'm challenging all the men who regularly preach and teach in our churches to allow this woman's message to be heard. I regularly read Song of Songs with college students in a Bible course that I teach, and in that conversation, I own up to the fact that I like sex, that 26 years into marriage, my husband and I are still into each other, that we still engage in pillow talk, and that we are learning with each passing year how to be more intimate with each other, sexually, emotionally, spiritually. A few of my students still insist that sex is not an appropriate subject for Bible class or even for the Bible. We take a vote at the end of these lectures and some even vote for removing it from the canon. <laughs> I often overhear at least one side of conversation as my students leave, well, that was awkward. And I find it ironic that locker room talk is forgiven in our sex-saturated society, but talking about sex becomes awkward in Bible class. We've taught our culture to prefer Genesis 3 to Genesis 2. So I have two closing spiritual lessons that I've gleaned from the lovers in the song. Actually, I'm only going to do one of them for the sake of time. I think this is the one that I want to um, focus on the most. <clears throat> I think the strongest spiritual lesson in the song is this. Someone with pastoral genius decided that the Song of Songs would be read at Passover. And here's what we know about Passover. It is the celebration of God's mightiest act of salvation in the Old Testament, the Exodus. God doing what Israel could not do for themselves, overcoming bondage, leading them through forces of evil, establishing the people as God's beloved. So when they gathered at Passover, they were very religious. It was the most religious they got all year. It was the height of their religious experience. They were religious. They, they listened uh, when they came together, the story of the Exodus and the Passover and God's salvation for them. And then somebody said, and at the end of that, let's read love poetry. Let's read the Song of Songs. And so I want you to think about why would somebody assign that? Someone did. 
so, uh, someone decided this is what we need to read on this occasion. Why would that make sense? Grapple with that a little bit. Why the Song of Songs with Passover, the celebration of salvation? I want to give it a little try for an explanation. I think this song helps us address what people are saying when they want to be spiritual but not religious. You hear about that. We know that there are people who say that. I'm spiritual but not religious. It's really actually not a new phenomenon. It's an age-old challenge of the life of faith. People, people want to pray. They don't just want to be religious. People want to worship. They don't just want to be religious. People want to feel the intimacy of a relationship with God. They don't just want to be religious. We should all remember that our religious ceremonies are important. They help us stay consistent. They help us preserve traditions and beliefs. But we also know that religion has the potential to overtake intimacy, to overtake what we call spirituality. It's a mystery, but I think it's sort of like this. Just like intimacy is about more than sex, and I think that's what the Shulamite woman is teaching us. Intimacy is about more than the physical act of sex. Intimacy with God is about more than religion. Intimacy is about far more than minimum requirements of church attendance and strictly enforced rules of religious observance. It's about more than doctrine. It's about more than technical disembodied readings of Scripture. Covenants are more about and more like making love than they are like making deals or making rules. And we need to remember God's covenant with us because we are forgetful creatures. So it's kind of like this. What we initially experience as earth-shaking and soul-changing in the early days of a relationship, we unfortunately eventually come to take for granted. That's true in our marriages. That's true with our children. That's true in our careers. It's, and it's true in our faith. It's true in our relationship with God. We initially experience this soul-shaking experience of following God, and yet sometimes it becomes routine. The truth is that we need to be religious and spiritual. We want to pray. And we want to know that we mean it. So in our religion, let's never forget the capacity that we have intimacy, for spirituality. I think the Shulamite woman is teaching us to remember who we were created to be by God. Remember Genesis 2. Don't remember Genesis 3. We were created and we have this capacity for intimacy. So as we go from this place, let's remember that we are ultimately Genesis 2 people, like the Shulamite woman describes. We are created for relationships. We are created for intimacy. We are created for spirituality. So in our religion, let's make sure we live like we know it. Thank you for being here today.